Steve Kaufman, welcome to my program. So thank I'm, you. Yes, glad to be here. Glad to be yes. here. I'm just reading off your internet introduction. Uh, you mm -hmm. have a website called thelinguist.com, but you mm -hmm. also have a big YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. you grew up in Canada, Montreal. Right. That sounds like a French-speaking part of the country. Well, it is. Uh, when I lived there in the 50s, Montreal, uh, even today, Montreal has maybe, I don't know, 20% Anglo or non-French-speaking people. But when I lived there, it was very much a divided city. I would say roughly one third Anglophone, two third Francophone. And in fact, there was a very famous novel written at the time called Two Solitudes. And so you lived in the English part of Montreal, you went to school in English, the stores were all in English, everything was in English, you had English TV, radio, and so forth. Today, it's much more mixed. Today, if you go to Montreal, it's a very bilingual city. It's probably the most bilingual city in Canada. But when I was growing up there, it was uh, life in the English-speaking part of Montreal, one million people, was no different from being in, I don't know, Buffalo, New York, or Toronto, or wherever. It would make sense if you speak only English and French, but you ended up learning a lot more than that. So you were counting 16 DSCC, DSCC, says? DSCC, según, <laughs> bueno, it depends how you count, okay? So I'm actually working on my... Uh, 19th, 20th, and 21st languages right now. Uh, I'm trying to learn Arabic, Persian, and Turkish at the same time, which is <laughs> lots of work. But um, yeah, uh, certainly 12 languages I can, you know, converse freely in. Uh, and there are others that I would have to warm up a little bit, you know, and, and some that I've kind of forgotten a bit. I was in Greece, I was in Romania. When I was there, I was speaking those languages when I was in the Czech Republic. Now, if I all of a sudden have to speak those languages, I struggle. So, yeah. Let me guess, maybe you started from French, because for me, I, my first uh, foreign language was English, and mm -hmm. I studied French in college, and I thought, oh, kind of, you know, there's a lot of similarities, right? And right. then I started speaking Spanish, and then I realized, okay, these are all similar, you know, muy similados. Inglés, mm -hmm. español, no importa. La diferencia no es muy grande. Sí. Pero, so how did that happen? Did you start from things that are similar, and then Chinese, Japanese later? Or? Okay. Bueno, vamos uh, a explicar en español, en francés, o en chino, <laughs> en japonés. <laughs> ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo vamos a explicar esto? Mezcla, mezclado, por favor. Me, mezclado. Bueno, eh, bueno yo el, el primer idioma que aprendí, donde bueno eh, tenía la impresión de hablar con fluidez, es el francés. Okay. Okay. Y una vez que tenía esta experiencia de hablar un otro idioma con fluidez, el, el francés, tenía la confianza. La confianza de que... Puede, puedo hacerlo con cualquier idioma. El uh, segundo idioma fue el chino. Oh, that's a drastic change going Drastic from the change. <laughs> so, you know, I had the confidence that I could learn another language because I had become comfortably fluent in, in French in another language. And I think, you know, for those of your viewers who are, say, learning their first foreign language, whether they're English speakers learning Japanese, let's say, or Japanese speakers learning English, until they've done it once, they don't have the confidence that they can do it. And, and I think that's almost the biggest obstacle. And uh, so they're trying to do something that they, at some level, think they can't do, which is not very good. Like if you're climbing a mountain and you don't think you're going to reach the peak of the mountain, that's not very good. So, but once I had done it for French, I had no doubt that I could do it for another language. And uh, I was working for the Canadian government in 1967. Canada was getting ready to recognize the People's Republic of China. So the Canadian government needed to train people in Mandarin Chinese. And so they selected me, partly because I started studying on my own to sort of force their hand. Uh, having heard that they were looking to send someone off to learn Chinese, I started studying on my own so that I could go to them and say, I'm your man. Because why wouldn't they choose someone who, you know, had started studying on his own? Because obviously learning Chinese requires a certain amount of motivation. And they don't want to send someone 
say a foreign service officer who then gets there and decides he doesn't like it or is motivated and stuff. So, so then I went to Hong Kong actually to learn Chinese. And then I went, uh, yeah. I, 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 one of the questions that I kind of prepared was that, uh, you know, when you speak different languages, are you the same person or do you change a little bit your personality and disposition and outgoingness and all that kind of stuff? I mean, probably you're the same person speaking English and French and those European languages, but Chinese and Japanese are different. Um, how would I put this? First of all, I don't know. I don't really think that the difference is so much, you know, Asian versus European languages. Uh, there are differences in the way people express themselves. The way Japanese people express themselves is very different from the way Chinese people express themselves. The way French people express social. The way it's uh, the, If there's a word in Chinese, you know the word sui the, the Chinese are more, in a way, spontaneous, in a way, uh, in a way casual. Not always, but it's more, they'll say kind of anything. Whereas the Japanese are much more careful. Hmm. much more careful in what they say, what they promise, which is a very good quality, by the way, if you're doing business in Japan. People don't make empty promises that they don't uh, deliver on, as a general rule. I mean, you can't. There are others who, who don't behave that way. Whereas the Chinese are more inclined, yeah, no problem, I can do this, I can do that. <laughs> so they're quite different. And the same is true between French and English. It's actually very different. The French are more sort of everything has to be logical and they're trying to show off how clever they are and stuff like that in their the way they express themselves and stuff. Whereas actually a lot of people who speak English, especially in North America, don't use the language very well. I mean, uh, they, they kind of stumble, not to the extent of President Trump, but they kind of stumble <laughs> with the language a bit. Whereas the French are very precise and accurate and stuff. And even between Quebec and France, there's a significant difference. So I don't see the difference as being primarily, you know, whether you're a Asian or European, obviously there's a significant Asian, you know, Chinese characters, Chinese culture influence in the neighboring countries. But I think the mm, intrinsic character of those people doesn't come from the Chinese words that came into the language. Uh -huh. I, I think it's something else. So I, I, but, so your original question though was, am I a different person? I don't think I'm a different person, but you imitate certain things, right? It's a little bit superficial, but you do. If you're speaking French or Spanish, hombre, or if you're speaking <laughs> Japanese, you, you end up being a, just a little bit different, but it's superficial. Fundamentally, you're the same person. That's how I see it. I feel the same when I'm speaking Japanese. I, I feel a little stiff and rigid, especially mm -hmm. when I'm talking to... Japanese adults or people mm -hmm. that I don't know well, but it's just the difference of how you appear and my face becomes more like painful. When I speak English, I try to appear relaxed, but it's the same person, but this kind of, it comes out kind of differently, but I'm the same person. But interestingly, long time ago when my English was not good enough, mm -hmm. then I felt like I'm becoming somebody else in English. Yeah. But I have learned English well enough to the point where I can just be myself and then just use different modes of expressions. But for me, Spanish, because I learned it just by speaking, I think of my old friends who taught me Spanish. Uh, you know, Mexican people, very friendly and sympathetic, simpaticos. Right. So I kind of begin to wear that kind of feel to myself. Right. Does that happen to you like that? I mean, when I think when we're learning another language, we're definitely influenced by that environment. When you speak your own language, it, that's really hardwired. You know, you grew up in it. It's, I'm not going to always, if I go to Australia, I'm not going to start speaking with an Australian accent. But if you're, if I am in the Kansai, my Japanese will become more Kansai. It will. If, if, uh, if I'm in Quebec even, my French becomes more Quebecois. So we're easily influenced. And um, I, I think successful language learners, they want to belong to the group. So when I was in Japan, I'm Japanese. If I sit in a meeting, there's all Japanese people there. I'm one of them. Like, I, I look different, but I don't see myself. All I see is 
my group, right? We're there, we're doing our thing. I want to be part of that group. I'm going to try to imitate, not deliberately, but, but naturally, I will try to imitate the way they behave. That's part of, I'm imitating the culture. I'm imita imitating the language. I want to be part of the group. So I think that's a natural, uh, natural tendency. I really like what you just said here, but I wanted to remind my viewers mm -hmm. about the meaning of the word Kansai. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All Kansai right. consists of a couple of prefectures in Japan, Osaka, right. Kyoto, right. that kind of region. And they right. are loud, they are open. And uh, I think some people who know me, I, we, I always talk about the differences between West Japan and East Japan. Right. People coming from East, from Tokyo, they kind of are stiff, they are polite, and they are kind of like struggle with their English. Uh, from West Japan, like Kyushu, I'm from Hiroshima, Osaka. We are more like, a, <laughs> <laughs> so we, I, and we can communicate better with foreigners, I think. And I just wanted to say that. But I, I really like your idea of imitating not just mm. the language, but right. some metalinguistic things and also right. um, peop, what people do. And I wanted to share a story with you. Every year around this time of the year, actually summer, we invite a group of Japanese students from the university that I gra that I graduated. We host a party for them, mm -hmm. and we recently had a party for ten students from Japan at a French restaurant. And they started wearing literally the, what do you call it, the napkin? Yes, They're like this. Yeah, like tuck this. it in their collar. There, yeah. When nobody else is doing it in America, right. and my wife, who was there, she's American. She said that. Can you just imitate what others are doing once you are in Rome? So right. this ability to imitate. So these kids, 10 kids from right. Japan, they came to the U.S. and they have this set mind. Maybe they read somewhere in the West, you wear it. Maybe somewhere in Europe, they may do that. I don't know. But this Chil is, Children do. Oh, <laughs> like a bib. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every one of these students was literally wearing. They were kind of imitating each other. Maybe. Right. But, right. But, yeah. but, you know, you can't blame them because it, 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 while we try to imitate, it's not something that you can do easily. Like it takes, obviously, if, if any of those students were to live, say, in the U.S. for even a few weeks or a few months, they would naturally start to imitate more and more. And, and some would want to imitate more than others. And I often make the uh, case that if we look at, say, we get foreign athletes, like in the U.S., baseball players from Dominican Republic. In Canada, we have hockey players from Czech Republic and Russia and Sweden. And if we look at the hockey players when they're interviewed, they all speak English very well with very little accent. Russians, Czechs, Finns. And if we find a professor at a university who is a Russian or a Czech or a Finn, he has a, or she has a much heavier accent because playing on a hockey team or a sports team, baseball team, whatever it might be, you're with your teammates, you're going out in the evenings, you're playing ball together, you're supporting each other, you're part of that group. And so naturally, it's easier to imitate the way the other members of that group behave. Whereas a professor at the university, he's got his little, you know, office, he takes himself very seriously. And, and so he doesn't assimilate to the, the language group quite as well. But it does take time. It's interesting when my wife, uh, she's an American, and when she visited my hometown, and later on, she tells me, you know, my favorite uh, person among the ones that I met and my best friend uh, um, now, and he didn't even speak English, but somehow, and he didn't go to college, but he was able to somehow enjoy time with foreigners because he's more relaxed. You know, mm -hmm. he's not like, uh, how do you say, a head person. He can right. crack a joke. And I think this story resonates with what you just said. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is it. Uh, your friend, I mean, he's not there representing, like in Japan, maybe less so now, but when I was there in the 70s, you would often say, what do you think of the Japanese? Well, like, what sort of question is that? Like, there's all kinds of Japanese. I don't have one view. And, and so I have this sense that like, we Japanese and I represent the Japanese. And no, you don't represent the Japanese. You're just one person. I may like you, I may not like you. Uh, I'm not gonna judge all Japanese by you. You know, so the, I think to some extent to be a successful language learner, you have to step outside. You're not there defending your culture. You're not there defend, hanging on to your culture. You're just an individual floating. You could float to Mexico. 
You could float to Japan, you could float to France, to China, to Morocco, and just try to fit in with other people. And I think so we have to have that, what I call sort of a uh, cultural weightlessness, okay? The more you're weighted down by your own culture, English speaking, Japanese speaking, Chinese speaking, doesn't matter, the less willing you are to float into this other culture. It doesn't mean you abandon your culture. You can float back to your culture anytime you want. But when you are learning that language and communicating in that language, you should try to float into that, la- into that culture. I, I, I think that's a great idea. When I was in college, I was studying English, but uh, at the same time, I was making a lot of friends. Sometimes I think my priority during college when I was studying you know, English was to make friends. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was thinking, even if I end up not being successful with language study, for example, I still make a lot of friends. <laughs> Right, and that was my kind of idea. Maybe I wasn't that uh, wrong in the way of thinking. Then, but by the way, I have a uh, subject that I would like to discuss. I saw your video where you talked about Dogen's Japanese, so <laughs> and uh, and I did a video where I said, and I've come, I've always said, you know, perfection is not the goal, and I don't. I I think that the overwhelming majority of people who learn a foreign language will not end up being mistaken for a native. They may get very good. And I've heard people say, look at, for example, Luca Lampuriello, I don't know if you know him, he's one of the sort of internet uh, polyglots. He speaks every language phenomenally well. And gee, he sounds like a native. But the only language that I can judge is English. And in English, he's phenomenal, but not native. In other words, there will be something that gives you away. No matter how well you speak the language, it might be a turn of phrase, it might be a slip in the pronunciation, something. So therefore, don't, there is no need to try to, quote, speak like a native. It, it, it's more important to communicate naturally. And that's where, again, you may have seen, I had this discussion with Matt. And, and you know, when I hear people talk about, you know, really spending you know years working on Japanese pitch and all this stuff. I have never bothered with Japanese pitch. I, I don't expect that Japanese people are gonna take me for a native. I'm able to communicate. I understand what they say. They understand what I say. We can discuss a wide variety of subjects. Uh, I'm not really, I, 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 I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with trying to get better and better and better, that's fine, but one should be realistic that no matter how hard you work at it, you will, it's highly unlikely that you will be mistaken for a native. I'm interested in this residual part of uh, um, uh, Dogen's Japanese. He's almost perfect, but there's this right. tiny little thing, and that tiny little thing can teach us a lot of things, I think, because that's you know usually something like about the way people breathe mm-hmm. or the way... Um, for example, if I listen to my own English, I can tell when I'm slightly off. That's when I am feeling nervous. Mm-hmm. And uh, nervous, nervousness comes in when I feel like, oh, I am wasting your time. Like that's the, I'm always struggling against Japanese culture because when we speak in Japanese, we are so brief and we don't really talk a lot unless the other person says, oh, that's right, oh, that's right. right. You know, yeah, yeah. That's how we speak. But in speaking in English, like in English, you're supposed to wait until the other person finishes talking. But that gives me some kind of a nervousness. Is he listening? Uh-huh. Am I boring you kind of stuff? So that's what I'm struggling. With. And that's when nervousness comes in. So it's interesting when you focus on the part that's not like a native speaker, you can learn a lot about that uh, speaker's culture, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Although I find, I've sometimes found the opposite when I find that North Americans come to Japan and the Japanese person has a, a number of things that he's going to say. So he says a certain amount, then there's a little bit of a lull. The North American jumps right in. You know, I, I'm sitting there because I've been living in Japan. I sense that this particular Japanese person has, he said 20% of what he wants to say. And there's another 80% there. So wait him out. Otherwise, you hear his 20%. Then you jump in with more of whatever you have to say. We're the best, we're the best. 
<laughs> very North America. And uh, so I find there's, but these are things, you know, developing that sensitivity to how people communicate in different languages. That takes, that takes experience. It's not something you can teach. Even myself, I struggle with it because when I try to speak with American people, you know, they talk a lot and I mm -hmm. end up being very brief. But I recently came up with a very interesting trick, which is to talk to you, for example, as mm -hmm. if, but in my mind, I'm just talking to myself. But you can't tell that I'm just talking to myself. Mm -hmm. But if I do that, I feel calm and I feel mm -hmm. like I don't have to be super brief because when I'm talking to myself, I'm not brief, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I practice and that's what I tell Japanese people when speaking in English. Just pretend like you're talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. That's my it's, it's It's interesting. Um, you know, I, I, if, you know the, the, the structure of Japanese is different. So again, all of these things take time to get used to. So Japanese people will say, you know, this meal is very good, just I think. Okay? So, to right. so, so everything, the, the verb is thrown at the end. Very difficult to get out of that habit. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's like articles, languages that don't have articles, like Russian, like Japanese. When do you throw in the, a, and? It's not obvious. It's not something that's in your language. It's not something that you grew up with. So you have to get so much exposure that eventually it becomes natural. But because if you try to rely on the explanation of the verb goes here, and if you start thinking about where the verb goes, you can't. You have to get used to saying, I think. Like you have to get used to, you begin by saying, I think. You don't say, it's a nice day, I think. You say, I think it's a nice day. You know, you can explain that. A Japanese person understands that like day one. Oh, okay, I understood. But that doesn't mean they're going to be able to do it. It, just because they understand that that's how English works, that doesn't mean they're going to be able to mm -hmm. do it. In order to be able to do it, you have to have so much exposure to the language that in your brain, naturally, certain patterns are formed that without thinking about it, you now start to say, I think. That's good. That's, it just takes time. Yeah. I want to share with you one more thing that Japanese right. people have struggled with, which right. is that uh, in the presence of others, Japanese people become a little quiet. Mm -hmm. Like... Right now, at the second, my wife started cooking in the kitchen area. Right. So she's there. And all of a sudden, my volume becomes like a quieter because we have this culture of, oh, we can't really bother people. If there's mm -hmm. somebody else out there, we don't want right. to be loud, which probably is the opposite of how Chinese people are. Chinese people in, like noise. Yeah, like, <laughs> and, they like noise. <laughs> Um, one of my best friends now, I mentioned him, but uh, he was saying, oh, you know, Chinese tourists are so loud. But now he's the loudest Japanese speaker that I've ever, ever known. But <laughs> even for him, Chinese tourists. But they don't have... Make, so we have this culture of when somebody's around, you cannot bother them by being loud. Right. But that doesn't work well in English, right? Because all of a sudden you're quieter, it's harder to hear you kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So many cultural obstacles, I think. Right exist for Japanese people to right. you know, be better at this um, speaking. But, but I think the, uh, the fundamental thing is, is still to have good comprehension. So if I speak to someone, you know, when I lived, I lived in Japan for nine years, did a lot of business in Japan. And if I'm speaking to someone in, in English and I have the feeling that they don't understand what I'm saying, we're doing business. And of course, if they want to speak English, I, I, I will you know, speak to them in English. It's rude if they're speaking in English for me to switch to Japanese. Uh, but then I feel uncomfortable. I say they don't understand, really didn't quite fully understand. So then I have to switch to Japanese. And similarly, if I'm in a language where I don't understand well, that's the most uncomfortable feeling. So I, I always say, you know, if you work on your comprehension, the rest of it, you can stumble a little bit when you speak. It doesn't matter. But if you don't understand what people are saying, わかる。今、今例えば僕カオス風マンさんが喋ってる時に、やっぱわかるんですよね。じゃあ。わかるから自信があって普通に喋れるっていうことですよね。そうです。あの、理解力が一番もう基本なんですよ。わからないとね。わ
、そういうことないんですよ。じゃあ読めるんか。それじゃあ、小説読めますかねあ,あるいはもう全部わかると言うけれども、それじゃあ映画わかりますかそんなにわからないんですよ、実際。だから本当に小説まで読めるならば、あるいは映画、テレビ番組,番組見てわかる。そういう程度の、そういうあの水準ですね、そういう程度の理解力があれば、もう、会話する、話する能力はない。のずから、わかります、はい。出るんですよ。なそそ基本はね、理解力ですね。だから合意。合意がないと理解力はないです。スティーブさん、僕ね、あのプエドアブラレス、スパニョール、はい、マスメノスビエンペロ、フランセスはもう、difícil para mí、porque no puedo entender、sí.。puedo oír、pero、sí. no puedo entender。por ejemplo、例えばこの間、えー、フランス人の人が、えー、なんて言ったかな、スモモンって言うんですよ。スモモンって。あ、そのえー、あって、ちょっとスペルを教えてくださいって言ったら、あ、uh,、this moment。で、そのスモモン、at this time。あ、スモモン、そ、そ、presque comme maintenant。あ、ほら、あ、スモモン。目で見たら分かるんですよ、スペルをね。でも聞いたら分かりにくいんですよ。うん、無理です,ですから、ねはい、まあ、だから、続けて聞くしかないんですよ。聞いて読む。だから、聞いて分からないと読まないといけないんですよね。あ、それで、じゃあ、なんか、うん、まあ、今、僕はアラブ語かなんか、まあ、勉強してるわけでしょ。で、聞いて分からない。読めば、あ、分かる。もう一度聞きました、まだ分からない。だから<笑>、問題はね、脳が、覚えますよ、徐々に。しかし、ゆっくりなんですよ。ゆっくりなんですよ。だから、うん、聞いてわからない、読んでわかる、また聞いてまだわからない、それの繰り返しなんですよ。うん、で、少しずつ、少しずつ、この脳を育つ、ね、時間かかるんですよ。そんないっぺんに上手になるわけじゃないんですよ。じゃあ、新しい言語を、OK、うん、イディオマのウェーブですかね。イディオマのウェーブ、ね、パラティ、パラステータ、はい、クワントパラティ、パラティ、パラティ、パラティ、コンビアントン、セネセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセセ Hablo español, hablo francés, italiano. Aprender portugués, bastante rápido. Pero aprender ruso, mucho más difícil. ¿Ok? Árabe, aún más difícil. Entonces, <risa> este depende de la distancia. Pero yo creo que, bueno, en principio, en tres meses puedes tener un sentido de progreso. Nada más. Un idioma que no conocía nada. Ahora entiendes un poco.、Y、puedes decir algo. Tienes la confianza de que puedes aprender este idioma. Tres meses. Según árabe, seis meses. Pero después, para poder hablar con fluidez, un año, dos años, tres años, mucho tiempo. Steve, s a n t o m o que va a dar a la i a Ya, 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 ya. ぜひまたお話ししたいと思います。えー、ぜひどうもありがとう。また明日。